Okay, welcome back everyone. We had a slight uh, technical hitch in the uh, virtual backstage, but we're back. Um, and we're here with Stuart Smith, an engineer from Arup, and he's going to be talking to us about a new paradigm for materials, looking at the circular building. Uh, just briefly on Stuart, Stuart Smith is a structural engineer and sustainability advocate working for Arup from Berlin. Since joining Arup in 1995, he's been engaged in the design of some of the world's most exciting as well as challenging building projects, including CCTV with OMA in Beijing and the Perez Art Museum Miami with Herzog and De Moon. Uh, well, these are just a few of Stuart's highlights. Um, and so I think what we'll do is we'll just hop right over to Stuart's talk and uh, I'll pass it over to you, Stuart. Looking forward to this. Thank you very much and um, yeah, absolute pleasure to be here even if it is um, remotely. So about 30 years ago I was sitting on a train as a young structural engineer and I looked out the window and thought how on earth can I design buildings and work as a structural engineer without having an impact on, on the environment? And I never found an answer to that question uh, until now. I was, um, you, you guys probably know very well Ed Batinsky but I only discovered his work about five years ago I was inspired by that um, he photographs big landscapes where we've had a major impact um, and this one's a copper mine in Utah and I was fascinated to, to know more about this and found that the, uh, the amount of copper that we get out of the ground has fallen from something like 15 percent down to decimal points. So we're increasingly mining more and more material as we're using more and more material. And then this photograph, a particular favorite of mine and a very stark picture of nickel tailings. And it set me thinking, you know, what do we actually use nickel for? Well, it's a, it's a fairly significant component in stainless steel. And that's a material that I guess we probably all use every day. And certainly it is a component in our mobile phones and computers. And then a, a, a building material uh, that we're using in, in a lot of our projects, marble. About 90% of the marble comes from a single source in Italy, Carrera. And the conditions for, for mining and extracting marble are quite treacherous for the open cast miners. And it creates a lot of dust, which causes all sorts of health problems. It made me realize and appreciate that the impacts of our materials are felt a long way away, the way we use them. And then in the construction industry, there's a huge amount of waste. We're living in cities where we tolerate a huge amount of demolition. And I always think, how could we possibly tolerate that in, in our houses, having builders in every 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 day almost? And the amount of disruption it causes when we go about our daily lives. And then the impact of construction waste. So waste is a big topic, uh, not just in the construction industry, but about 50% of the waste that we generate in cities comes from construction and then a lot of the materials that we use end up on as, as landfill we're, we're improving quite rapidly but it's still a, a big issue and all of those material impacts before we even start to think hard i found a study um in the in new scientist something like 10 years ago which looks at rare earth metals and um, and, and precious metals and the study suggested that using our current rates of consumption compared to our current rates of extraction that we would run out of silver in only nine years time. Now what's happened since is that we've increased production and reopened old mines to, to, uh, to, to gather more silver. And silver is a component that we find in our mobile phones so we're using it every day pretty much. But to extract silver from the ground about one ton of raw material with silver ore yields about three grams of silver. Whereas if we took one ton of mobile phones, we would get something like 3000 grams of silver. So it's an incredible, incredible impact um, in terms of use and reuse of materials compared to extracting raw materials. And when I started this research, uh, the, the impact on construction materials was perhaps felt further away. But nobody could really imagine that in a very short space of time we would be worrying about sand in the construction industry and, and access and, and availability of sand which seems like a completely common material but that's happened in the last five years 
And then there are geopolitical issues as well, with countries wanting to have their own supply of these metals. The USA stopped production of certain rare earth metals some time ago, but have just recently, as recently as 2010, restarted. So there are geopolitical issues around their material supplies as well. And so all of that comes before we talk about the biggest topic that faces us, or the most immediate topic, which is around carbon. And I wanted to try and put the carbon impact of our materials into some kind of perspective. I've spent something like the last 20 years as a building engineer, surrounded by uh, other engineers in other disciplines, looking at the use of energy in buildings, and that become the headline topic in the construction industry, energy use in buildings. Buildings. Now, buildings account for something like nine gigatons of, of carbon out of a total using quite round numbers of 50 tons, 50 gigatons. The uh, information here comes from a, a, a fantastic source without hot air. Um, when you look at our material impact, it's something like three gigatons. So it's, it's comparable, I would say. And as we start to improve uh, energy efficiency in buildings so we start to see the mix between carbon that comes from from operational as opposed to embodied energy starts to become closer to equal for new build construction so this topic's become quite a significant one in a very short space of time for us and to put that into some sort of con context uh, air travel is about two gigatons and we certainly worry about air travel in terms of carbon impacts so talking to two colleagues um, and, the, and our team in ARAF in terms of foresight and innovation, I started to appreciate the ideas around the circular economy and the idea of using and reusing materials and saw that as a potential solution to all of these problems combined to the way we use materials. And I set about testing that in the built environment. So this project, uh, Circular Building, which is now five years old, was to try and build a building that would test all of these principles around materials and how we use them in the built environment and embrace the principles of the circular economy. And at the time, uh, I remember circular economy uh, only five years ago wasn't uh, a big topic in uh, in construction. Um, and now I think it's uh, it's um, it's something that we hear all the time every day. So the idea was to take a whole series of components from the building industry and to assemble them into a building and then take it all apart, give it back to the original suppliers so it could all be remanufactured and reused in other places. We used a very simple QR coding system to record all of the materials and related that to our own 3D digital model. And then for the design, one of the things that um, I understood uh, very well from looking at research by Stuart Brand he studied how buildings change over time and he looked at the interface between the layers of the building he broke it down into six layers which he called the successes and i understood that this was one of the keys that would unlock how we could approach materials and the circular economy in the, in the built environment and i wanted to use that research as a very literal diagram for the building and so we broke the building down into its various layers so that we could separate them and, and return them back to manufacturers. I'm just going to talk through some of the lessons that we learned, some of the things we found in, in doing this project. And then talk a little bit about how we've brought that up to date um, and started to see that appear in projects. But it, as I say, it has taken five years to get there. So in terms of the site, uh, this is a picture taken from the same spot but about 100 years apart really interesting work by a guy called Mark Klett and it you can see it's a silver mine in Nevada but the buildings and the materials have completely disappeared as you look at the natural landscape if you study the photos you can see uh, natural features which still remain but absolutely no trace of the buildings whatsoever and and this is this is something when, when we when we do build our buildings we always think of them as permanent but they're completely temporary, as it shows from all of the demolition that we see in our cities. And then at the London Design for the London Design Festival in, in London, we had 2016, we had one month to buy a building up and take it away again. So for the structure, I, I didn't want to just use um, 
ecological materials that, 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 that could be repeated at smaller scale. I wanted to really address the problems that we found in our cities and building in steel and concrete. So we chose a steel frame for the building. And we went to ArcelorMittal in Luxembourg and found they had a whole bunch of steel pieces in their, in their yard. We measured the pieces up and we adapted our design to suit what they had. And we tried to minimize the impact that we had in terms of changing the material with connection designs and so on that had minimum impact. And afterwards, we gave it all back to them. Now, only about 5% of the steel that we recover is used in this form. The rest of it tends to go into electric arc furnaces. It gets melted down using energy and then uh, remanufactured. So, of course, it's also lowering in grade all of the time. And then for the, uh, for, the, for the skin of the building, we used a material called Ecoia, which is a softwood that has a, a pickling process that gives it the durability of a hardwood. So it's a very long-term durability, which means it can be used and reused. It also comes from actual source and can just be grown very quickly, as opposed to hardwoods, which take a very long time to grow. This was all mounted on cassette panels where we used Eco board, which is a cradle to cradle material, so it could be recomposted back into the environment. And we used a technique um, for, for that, which, which used no fixings, uh, which we'd explored a couple of years earlier on a building called the Wiki House. And then for the facades, uh, one of the problems that we face in, in facades is the lifespan of the uh, ins insulation glazed unit. So the silicon seals on the double glazed units fails after about 20 years and needs significant amounts of replacement and with this we were trying to build a facade system where you could clamp the panes of glass together and monitor the moisture content in in between the panes and we're still working to try and develop that system now and then uh, for the for the roof light windows you see there we used a, a well-known manufacturer and wanted to be able to return the, uh, the components back to the manufacturers. And one of the problems that we encountered was the reverse logistics that many manufacturers don't have in place. And some of the manufacturers we spoke to at the time had no reverse logistics to accept their goods back into their yard and remanufacture them. But we're now seeing many businesses and firms start up with that as a business model. And so that's really a, a, a big enabler now for the circular economy. And then for the building services, for the internal services in the building, uh, we uh, we wanted to um, have some fun with that. And we, we developed and built our own 3D printed mechanical ventilation with heat recovery unit using recycled plastics, but a component based design that could be stripped back down to its component pieces and remanufactured. And then we use things like cardboard ductwork to, um, to allow everything to be recycled or, or reused in, in different ways. And it's it certainly strikes me that the um, building services is an, is an area where we have a very rich opportunity to implement uh, circular building into uh, circular economy principles into construction. For the building itself, we had uh, very smart controls. So minimizing the amount of energy use with low energy lighting and so on, and putting everything onto DC circuits as opposed to AC circuits. So that was low, uh, low energy demand as well. And by minimizing the energy demand and, and using smart controls, we could use this. This is a, a salt water battery. Um, in, in terms of use in Europe, there, there's not so many of them. I think this is only the fifth one uh, imported into the UK, but it's one of the world's only cradle to cradle batteries. It, all of the components can be remanufactured and stripped down and it uses salt water as the electrolyte. And we coupled that with uh, the potential to use renewable energy supplies to, uh, to have a, a circular use of resources in, in terms of energy. And then in terms of the space, I think it's been really interesting over the last two years to see the way that the way we use buildings and how it's changed and how we use space. So things that we never thought possible before um, in terms of remote working, particularly in, in Arab, uh, we have 16,000 employees 
and I think we've had something like 90% or, or more working remotely and we found it very successful and we've been able to carry on working through the pandemic but it definitely challenges us to rethink the way we use space um, a lot of us converted our homes into flexible spaces where we can use them as offices as well and a lot of offices of stood empty um, and now thinking about how they use and reuse and we're seeing an awful lot of retail spaces being used and reused in different ways and so maximizing the amount of floor space and, and the way we use it uh, was a theme of the circular building so we wanted to create this open flexible space and then the idea would be to use platforms like airbnb which are also super popular in, in terms of being able to maximize the use of our homes to uh, to achieve that and then the internal um, internal fittings and, and the, the stuff that goes inside our buildings this is a this is an area where we see the circular economy already appearing so in terms of office furniture and materials and, and goods in, in our buildings particularly with uh, reducing ownership um, or, or giving ownership away so that we don't own the materials but we lease them and give them back to manufacturers so the carpet here is a carpet manufactured by a firm called Desso you rent the carpet at the end of life of the carpet they'll come take the carpet away give you a new carpet and they'll remanufacture that carpet into the next new carpet for the next customer so therefore creating complete circular process and this is something that we want to be able to drive back into all of the layers of the building so we can see uh, material ownership changing as well in, into the future so that was a complete um, exploration of um, the, the circular economy in the built environment through a prototype project and then I started uh, looking at some of the other prototypes and some of the other studies and, and, and going through the various layers and how they were working so this is a project with um, a, a, a group in Copenhagen 3xn and lendiger and and others looking it's called the circle house um, and they had found uh, a client to, to build something like 60 units housing units in a circular construction and in particular what i found interesting the uh, the market in denmark is very much based on precast and they were trying to take pre standard precast components and use connections between precast concrete components in steel Pico units that would allow them in future to unbolt and reuse and remanufacture those units. I, I think that's quite uh, that that then demands an awful lot of modularization and standardization from the construction industry. So this was an experiment. I think the experiment was a little bit more about how to use and reuse steel, and this was an experiment in how to use and reuse concrete. And then another project uh, for the um, design festival in Eindhoven in, in the Netherlands, the People's Pavilion. The idea here, this was, um, this, the, the idea here was to take uh, all of the materials, put them together and give them back directly to their owners. So the whole thing came as a design for this assembly so that every, every structural connection could be reversed. All of the materials could be separated back into their component parts and then they could all just be recovered and given back to manufacturers so that was a successful demonstration as well of circular principles in design and it suggests that if you're not owning the materials then perhaps you could be paying for performance as opposed to paying for materials and goods and we've started to explore that in various parts of the construction industry so a fairly well-known case is with Philips, where you're paying per lux, so you're paying for the light you use as opposed to the fittings. Philips own the fittings and would, um, and they're therefore responsible for uh, changing them, maintaining them, and so on, which incentivise the, them in terms of how they design and manufacture their fittings and what materials they use to design them for longevity. And you simply pay for the light you use. And we've started to see that in uh, in the world of building services so this is an example from care in singapore where they have realized that a lot of building owners are paying for utilities like energy and water and why not pay for air and air conditioning 
and so you pay for the air conditioning you use care look after all of the central plant they maintain it upgrade it keep it running efficiently and they're incentivized to do that and the customers just pay for the air conditioning so this is also driving a lot of efficiency in the construction industry and then the, the wiki house uh, which was in 2014 so this is an interesting study in open source design so the idea was that you could take a pattern from the internet a building pattern you could 3d print the pattern so this was just a laser cut in 2d panels and then you could assemble that building yourself on site and the idea then that you put all the pieces together and you made your own house but the the ideas that we tested here was were around digital design and around monitoring the spaces and once you're you're starting to monitor the space and you can monitor the performance you can monitor the performance of your facade the performance of your building services systems uh, you can work out when materials are degrading when they're not performing anymore and then upgrade them much more specifically rather than replacing large parts or even complete buildings so a large part of what we're um, what we're doing is facilitated by modular and off-site construction so the idea of design for deconstruction is a lot about if you start in the factory I also imagine that you can go backwards and return buildings to the factory environment so this project in London Leadenhall Tower with Richard Rogers it's 220 meters tall um, it was designed and built with uh, Langer Rourke and a lot of the construction uh, was done off-site so 85 percent of construction off-site which is quite unusual for a London city office development so large modules were brought to site pre-assembled um, concrete floor plates were pre-cast and then stitched together on site so minimizing white rates and so on now whilst at the time we didn't have a plan for how this building could be deconstructed I think the fact that it's made off site and then put together on site does suggest you could take it apart and then return it to manufacturers which would facilitate a lot of circular processes and we also have a project in um, in Brooklyn Atlantic Yards which is one of the biggest um, modular housing products in the world 36 stories so unusual at this height to volumetric modular system and the idea here being that you, you can um, very speedily build using large volumetric units it's actually very difficult to find suppliers and consistency in the supply chain and, and that prevents a, a lot of clients and and, um, and uh, consultants actually specifying modular construction but in terms of how it works it's very much factory made systems and components put together in modules and then delivered to site very um uh, very uh, totally minimizes the wet trades on site so everything is fitted together dry jointed and can be taken apart later and that allows you to change and develop modules over time as well and recover parts of the building so this again is a simple steel framed box uh it doesn't have a concrete floor it uses a, a build up of um uh of t uh, timber based panels for the floors and the walls and the systems and then uh, off-site construction this uh, it's taking perhaps the next step uh, this is a project uh, I wasn't it's not an Arab project but we have worked quite closely with Mace and others uh, at East Village in in London to look at how you could build very quickly and really embrace the idea of off-site construction so this was 98% off-site and this was done using something called a rising factory so the so these two big white boxes you see at the uh, on the two towers they start off at ground level and you build the building within the factory and as you build you jack the factory up so the factory rises as the building rises what that then allows you to do is you can you can build internally within the space in a factory environment which means you can have a component based design the idea here is that you've got you've got overhead cranes inside the space you've got an overhang on one side so you can drive your materials and components up to the side of the building 
lift them up with the crane into 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 place and then assemble the building inside the vol inside the with a protected volume that then allows you to, to have a completely component based design and it really changes the environment in terms of the construction site it also allows you to component based design all of the services and pre-install them into pre-assembled units and, and cages which then just get delivered and, and, and put up so a typical tower like this might take two years to build this is saving something like six months off of the uh, construction program so it's also starts to reduce that problem we have of uh, construction in our cities and in city environments and then taking that a bit further um, most have been working and partnering with a company called Hickory and they have a building system in Australia where it's not quite the modular system so it's not a volumetric modular system it's based on unitized flat panels but what they do is they take those panels to the facade factory and fit the facade onto the panels and then they erect that as a unit so they get the structure and the shell up very quickly and they build it to facade tolerances which means that they can then modularize a lot of the other components so uh, whereas you, you might be delivering materials to site and cutting them to, to fit on site particularly with the with the internal fit out because of the very high tolerances with off-site construction you can still imagine bringing to, bringing modular units to site to complete the fit out on site so that's a good um, kind of in between between uh, modular construction and flat panel construction and the other part of this is that they used electric cranes so the construction is super quiet and one of the other problems related to our construction industry is the amount of construction traffic we have on our roads so in in melbourne i think they were able to agree that they would construct and erect these units overnight because it was happening so quietly and it was taking construction traffic off the roads so now you see um, quite a lot quite a lot of other benefits from design for disassembly off-site construction and, and off-site manufacture and I want to give you um, an example from one of our recent projects now, um, which wasn't uh, necessarily designed uh, for, for disassembly, but uh, through using those principles, we've managed to refurbish an old Harrop project and upgrade it significantly and really embrace some of the principles of circular economy. So this building was built, in the, built and designed in the 90s. In 1998, it was complete. It was designed for trading, uh, but it became back office after about 12 months. It's, it's a, a basically square plan with four corner cores, quite a low rise building. Uh, it uses facades, uh, uni unitized glazed facade from shoulder bell and French limestone for the cladding. The, uh, the challenge was to retain the building, but to enhance and, uh, and upgrade it had a very big atrium so we were able to use that to our advantage to create more office space and then to extend it uh, three floors up so we increased the office area significantly 100% uplift in office area without any increase in the in the plant rooms and these are the principles so it had one of the bigger um, big, I think it had the biggest internal atrium space in in uh, in London it was a pre-let so we were able to work, work with a tenant that was already accepted to come into the building so we we narrowed the atrium we extended the cores we had a setback at the top level and then we added additional floors and the basic idea of this design then was to adopt those principles of design for disassembly for the, for the new components to adopt very high principles in terms of sustainable performance not to take materials off site uh, to, to waste but to either return them to manufacturers or to remanufacture them and bring them back to site and we adopted a principle in terms of sustainability of marginal gains now marginal gains is a, a term borrowed from the british olympic cycling team where to increase their speed they talked about marginal gains so they did all the all the little things sort off all the bits of material material from their bikes that they didn't need um spent ages working on aerodynamics the helmets and the and the um 
the materials they were wearing, every single little thing they did to have a marginal gain for slightly more speed. And we took this approach um, for the for the building. So everything we could possibly do to enhance the performance uh, and, and gain some sustainability um, opportunities through through the building we did and we took. So it covered lots of small things like reusing concrete paving, uh, sustainable urban drainage systems, um, photovoltaics on the roof, uh, creating the, ex the staircases as external spaces rather than internal spaces so they weren't uh, heated or conditioned. And you can see through this cutaway diagram where we've added the space above and there's a break between the existing and the new build structure above. So to reuse the structure, we had uh, steel bracing in each of the cores for stability. But since it was a concrete frame, there's stability that you can take from the concrete frame. One of the things that, that really um, benefit, benefited us here was that we had all of the digital information having been the original designers in the 90s. So we could return to it um, and, and rethink areas that we wanted to rethink with a lot of detail to support it um, so we could we could look again at the reinforced concrete frame we could take that into account in terms of stability for increasing the height we could relook at the wind loads we consulted with our windex experts to reduce the wind loads the live load allowances on the floors were generous and we reduced those to minimum to give us some capacity for adding floors and we had all of the foundations, um, foundation designs, so we could then work through adding uh, strengthening in, in the basement using um, simple um, low rise headroom piling rigs. And these are the various measures that we took. So, in strengthening the foundations, adding lightweight structure above in steel and lightweight concrete decks to, uh, to get the complete enhanced structural system so uh, minimizing the weight uh, freeing up all of the imposed loads that we could and uh, and adding new piled foundations which we then stitched into existing foundations to reuse all of the structures and then for the facades this shows you a, a picture of our design intent with what we finally built the lower part of that is the um, is the existing building and the upper part the new the new part that we've added so we had an external screen it was a uh, innovative for the for the 90s um skin facades um were, were, were just were just being developed at the time and so the the idea of uh, a, a high performance double skin facade allowed us to take that outer skin off and then remanufacture it we retained the existing stone panels and windows and we reused granite panels at the lower part of the building. And then the new cladding came above and we were able to match that to the, to the cladding below. To keep track of all these different cladding systems, we used a, a tool called Arab Street, which allows us to track and enter into a digital database all of the uh, designs that we were developing. So the existing double skin facade, and this is where we were able to remanufacture the, the existing facade and return it to the building. So to improve the, the light at lower levels, because we were enclosing some of the atrium spaces, we lifted this facade one story up, which then allowed us to connect the new level at the high level. And then we put a new facade at the bottom part. So that was allowing us to improve the environmental conditions inside the building. And that was the facade we were able to take away and reuse. So we had all of the details for uh, for the facade system, which allowed us to go through forensically and study each of the different pieces that we, we were uh, either using or reusing. So what you see here, in uh, the red dotted box, the uh, insulated glazed units were about 20 years old and the silicon seals had failed. And this is one of the problems we were trying to address on the circular building. So those ribbon windows were taken out, returned to the manufacturer and replaced with new windows. In light blue, all of the pieces 
that, that we were able to retain in, po in place and then in purple pieces that we took off we um, took away to uh, to a pop-up factory nearby remanufactured and brought back to the building now one of the um, one of the things that facilitated this if we'd have returned it to the original um, uh, supplier that would have meant some significant transport costs and carbon impacts from the transport so by finding uh, some space locally we we were able to create a temporary factory that we could use to remanufacture and refurbish the facade so we stripped it all down cleaned it all up put it all back together replaced gaskets and then we're able to bring it back and put it back onto the building so you see their um, work in progress you see the external um the external skin of the uh double facade being replaced the internal ribbon windows are replaced with new windows and then the remainder there existing kept in place and the new unitized cladding below and then with the stone facades we were able to fuck to go back to the original source of materials um to, to um to be able to go back to the quarry that we originally sourced the materials from to be able to match the uh, the existing facade so we we're able to clean those stone panels up and then add new ones above and by going by, by taking the materials from the original source and cleaning them up and then mixing them up so we managed to to create the same effect as as the original building so we had three different shades of panels so light medium and um light medium and dark we were able then to put that all back together and, and match the panels new with old and then the atrium roof light which was significantly smaller than the original was a key component in terms of being able to get enough daylight through the building and into the spaces and so that was studied in quite some detail and different glazing arrangements until we got that uh, completely sorted and there you see the progression from um, where we started in 2000 with the completed building with a big central atrium into um, the construction much smaller atrium space and then now completed in 2020 with a lot of components reused and refurbished and matched to existing and all really made possible by the fact that we had a significant amount of information on the building from the original design and we saved huge amounts of carbon um, I mean broadly 50% less than a comparable new build in London so 54% uh, less embodied energy and with more efficient building systems so not not increasing the uh, plant space at all in the building we were able to in, uh, improve the operational carbon by 56% less CO2 so that that's an example of uh, how we were able to bring um, circular principles on onto that refurbishment project uh, both for uh, the facade and the structure but also the um, the building services and um, looking at how we can adapt and take the lessons from the, from the um, circular building and adjust them now to to facilitate the circular economy in the built environment i think being able to separate the layers the, the design for disassembly is a super critical part of it and then being able to separate ownership of the of the uh, materials and components and, and provide some of those as a service would then allow us to have more efficient designs and, and better use of materials but to track all of that and make it happen we need a huge amount of digital data and a digital uh, digitally enabled platforms to be able to share and reuse materials so after completing the circular building we launched something called the Arab global research challenge in 2017 to look at how we could um, tag material and um, tag materials on site and create material passports that would link to the digital twins and the, and the BIM models that we were creating and then link those back to the physical building and allow you then to uh, to find those materials and then to get them into 
online platforms that would allow them to, to be uh, used by, by others and, and, and remanufactured, resold or, or whatever the future use was. So this was a, a study to see whether we could RFID tag materials, upload them into a cloud platform and, and reuse them. And we did this with David Ness and the team in the University of South Australia. And what we were able to, to show was that by tagging um, materials in, in, in a real building, we could relate that to a cloud-based platform and then uh, reuse those in, in future designs. So, so creating this uh, link between the digital world and the physical world that would allow us in the future to do this across many, many buildings. And once this starts to happen at scale, then I think we'll see a lot more um, of, of circular principles in, in design and construction. So in Europe, one of the um, one of the other things that will facilitate this is the Modasta project. So the Modasta project is a project uh, to create a digital uh, database of uh, the built environment um, that then will allow us to, to access all of that information on a, on a digital platform. So this has started in Amsterdam and uh, Arab, we've just partnered with Modasta to um, to uh, roll this out in, in Germany. So if you put that digital information together with the um, with the RFID material passport digital tagging, relating that to the digital world and then back to the physical world, I could see in the future us being able to deliver a circular economy in the built environment. And things are changing now very quickly in, in Europe. In, in Europe, we have EU taxonomy, um, which is the EU now legislating in future for the circular economy to become um, a requirement in the built environment. So reusing of materials in terms of construction waste, life cycle assessments of the whole building, uh, construction designs that support circularity, reuse of materials, um, material passports and digital models um, becoming the norm. Um, and, and we have um, and we have and, and are seeing now lots of clients coming to talk to us around that. And so we're developing um, a circular design toolkit which we'll be launching at COP26 which will allow uh, designers to, to look at their designs and assess them for circularity and to meet the, uh, the coming forthcoming EU taxonomy. And that, I hope, will then facilitate us using buildings in our cities as material banks into the future. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Stuart. Uh, that was a, a great talk. Uh, you covered a lot of ground. Uh, you absolutely got my wheels turning. And um, <laughs> despite our uh, little glitch off the bat, we've got uh, time left for questions, which is fantastic. Um, the first question here. Um, so yeah, interesting to see a number of building services, for example, air conditioning, lighting, uh, carpets, are looking to different business models to drive new revenue streams. Um, is anyone thinking this way with major structural components? Uh, yes, we we are. I mean, it's quite interesting to see uh, we, we've got a number of temporary buildings, which um, I mean, you know, my home city at the moment is Berlin, and uh, there are constant temporary buildings being put up for all sorts of public uh, events. And, and actually they're quite sophisticated buildings and they're only there for about four weeks. So put them up, take them away again. I think it's just changing the timeline that we're using our buildings for. I think I think the design, the sort of temporary designs are all there, designed for disassemblies there. I think it's just a question of, of, of that bridging that gap between the, the sort of one month to three month you to the 50 year design life that we're currently seeing in our buildings. So. Yeah, it's happening. It's just just a just a gap there in between. Yeah, it's fascinating and then great to see. I think about that as I'm walking around my house. Like, there's so many components that at some point, before the life the house needs to get deconstructed, are going to have to be replaced. But I'm like, how would you ever get access to that system to replace it? You know, and it just seems so poorly considered. 
Well, the, the, I think this is um, and when you when you sort of bring it down to your own. One of the things I did alongside the circular building, we had an exhibition called Circular Living, and that was looking at um, the kind of stuff we use day to day, and how that could be recycled and remanufactured. And of course, it's a lot easier for manufacturers at that scale to to recover their uh, products. But if it's not there, you just don't know what to do with it. So if your toaster breaks down or your TV set doesn't work, it's you know what do you do with it? There's a whole bunch of materials and 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 you know throw it on the skip, take it to the dump, whatever you do. And and it's sort of changing those principles in the way we live is I think going to happen very quickly. And what I'm really trying to do is to bring that into the built environment as quickly as we can, so that we can imagine remanufacturing materials. I and mean, if you do a a job in your in your own home a small sort of like refurbishment of your bathroom you're going to fill a skip right outside your house and you probably won't know what to do with it and uh, that's something that i think we we need to change and, and i think in the next five years particularly you know in the eu with all of the legislation that's coming around building waste and materials and so on that that's going to turn that into a, a valuable resource and we already start to see a few small contractors working in the deconstruction and the re and the reclamation field with with materials once that grows and there's a much bigger um, sharing of resource and and, and, and um, online platforms that allow you to find what's there and to find it when you need it and i think the circular economy will, will then start to grow quite quite quickly and if we're if we're designing for that to happen in the future then you know hopefully it's not long before we're eliminating waste um and, and 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 changing business models as well yeah i agree um next question i think ties in nicely to this thinking um what lifespan are you thinking about when you're designing buildings for disassembly uh well i think that's quite interesting uh, in terms of um just changing our thinking about building as having a, a design life um typically our structural codes would say 50 50 years for a building in terms of the wind loading or whatever it might be. Um, I'm, ch I'm really trying to change that mindset completely and for us to see a building as a series of layers, which each layer having its own design life. So when you're designing the building services, you might be designing for 20 years, but if you're, um, if you're changing that thinking into, into paying for a service and performance, then you might design components that you would recover after five years. Or you, or you might be having major components changed and recovered after 20 years, or you could consider designing the mainframe of a structure for 100 years or more, but just making sure that all of it's recoverable. So in terms of in terms of uh, design life, it's whatever's appropriate for the components that you're designing, but making something that you can you can recover after you've finished using them. Great points. Yeah, I agree. Um, maybe one more question um the eu taxonomy uh, that, that you talked about is that something that's regulated or is it a suggestion at this point at this point it's a, it's a suggestion but i think it's coming quite quickly on on the back of the conversation around carbon so i think a lot of people mix up, up um different strands of of um circular economy i think you know carbon's a super important topic and that's the one we're all focused on I see, um, and, and so that's the one that's being legislated for very quickly now. But I think just behind that, you know, we're understanding that there's lots of other impacts around materials and so on. So that legislation's coming in in, I think, 2023. So we're already working towards it. Um, if you're designing a project now, if you've got a project now on your drawing board, it might be two to five years before that arrives on, on site and construction. And if you're not looking ahead at these things, then you know you're designing projects that are going out of date quite quickly and potentially running into trouble with with uh, taxonomy and also in terms of green financing as well so we're seeing a lot of um, financing now is heading towards projects where you can demonstrate credentials against things like eu taxonomy in terms of embodied carbon and circular economy and so on so um so it's not legislation yet but it's coming excellent well, thank you so much, Stuart. I uh, really appreciated your, your time, your presentation. Certainly got my, um, my wheels turning, and uh, I'm going to walk away from this thinking a little bit differently. Um, cool. For everybody, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs>